Hello, thank you and welcome to Can TV, the NAACP Chicago Westside Branch episode. We are so glad to see you and looking forward to having some great conversations today in terms of police. We've been working really hard to get things done and I'm looking to hear from you. Please give me a call with any questions and comments. That's what tonight is really about, hearing from you. Call us at 312-738-1060. That is 312-738-1060. And also I wanted to let you know that the NAACP has a weekly meeting, a monthly meeting, I'm sorry, every first Saturday. We have a monthly meeting at one o'clock um, every month except for July. You can email us at the Westside NAACP at gmail.com or give us a call at 773-261-5890. Once again, you can come to our Saturday meetings the first Saturday of every month at 1 o'clock and we can be found at 5820 West Chicago Avenue, um, Chicago, Illinois. And so back to what our topic is today, if you don't know, the NAACP Westside Branch, as well as a number of other groups such as Black Lives Matter and the Urban League, Network 49, have all been a part of a lawsuit to sue the city of Chicago in the desire to get a consent decree for police reform in the city of Chicago. This has been a process that we've been working on since we first filed our claim last July, and we look forward to Getting some police reform is moving forward. The Attorney General, Lisa Manikin, has been having some meetings lately talking about the consent degree process and how that's going to work. And so my question tonight is, do you believe that police are needed in the city of Chicago? And I'm asking that question just the way I said it. Do you believe that they're needed? And it looks like we have a caller. And yeah, so, hello. Yeah, my name is James. Uh, like, okay, like, uh, Conway is going too far. I think he need help. Conway need help because uh, he been down, been too, he been hanging with Donald Trump too long, and uh, he need help. Okay, um, I would agree with you. I'm not fully up, caught up on the Kanye situation, but I'm sure that that's very true. Um, and we also have some communication about the city of Chicago police. Um, and what they've been doing. We've been looking at some issues of abuse. You may have recently heard that the Betty Jones case came out in which a grandmother was shot in a hallway. And very recently, maybe about two or three weeks ago, a ruling was made to say that that officer was not guilty of any kind of misconduct or murder. And he was released and the case is kind of just silent. It's those kinds of issues that we are talking about tonight is with things like that occurring, with people being left dead in the street and all of the crime that we've seen, the crime keeps going up in the city of Chicago. Do you think that the Chicago police force is a necessary force to have in the city? Do you stand there are some groups who say we should just get rid of them and start over? Do you have thoughts about that? Do you think that's important? We've also had conversations saying that we should not have police officers within our schools. They often ask as security and other um, terms and guards of authority. Sometimes they act as deans in that position. What do you think the process is and should be as far as police in schools, do you think they should only be called in if a situation occurs, if something jumps off, then all of a sudden it's okay for officers to be in a school? Or do you think they should have a standing and stable role as they currently do? Although we found out from the attorney inspector general's office that that role that they play is not constant and continuous across the city of Chicago. Some of them just come in and they watch the door and they kind of make sure that nothing goes down or occurs in the school while others do act in the role of Dean having continuous and constant contact with the children of the city of Chicago. What do you think about that? Is that something that you think is a good idea? I've heard things from both sides. Some saying let's get rid of them. Some saying there's no way that our schools can be safe without them. This is an interesting conversation as we did have um, as our caller mentioned some 
commentary from Trump who was saying give the teachers guns and let them just basically become the policemen of their classrooms for different situations. And of course, Facebook went live with what that would mean to black students inside of their classrooms. Do you think that the police play that same role and they're just as dangerous in the schools as a teacher with a gun or more so? We're looking to hear what that conversation is going to be and what it's going to mean for us as we look forward. Some of the things that we've done in our consent decrees, some of the rulings that we've made is talking about recruitment. The idea of having a community decide who is going to be their police officer. If you have someone that you know and you've trusted and you've come up through your community and you say, you know what, um, we think that you should come become an officer in our school and, or, I'm sorry, not in our school, in our neighborhood and make sure that they are able to get into that process. These are some of the recommendations that we're making and thinking about as we approach this idea of the consent decree. But I'm very anxious to hear from our community members, from the residents of the city of Chicago, is how do they feel about that? Is that something that they would advocate for? Do you want specialized training? Do you want to know that you have an uncle, a brother, a sister, a neighbor, a friend, who has become an officer, someone that you trust to protect you when a situation arises or occurs. Other things that we've had discussions about is having other kinds of people as the first call when a situation occurs, especially a nonviolent situation. Someone who has some training with dealing with people who have mental illness, people who have training dealing with um, people of various backgrounds and cultures to be their first response when a situation occurs versus a police officer. Some of the things that we've recommended also have been to possibly look about clearing out our standing officers to put in officers that we feel are going to be better able to speak and deal with issues as we've seen them and less ready to pull a gun on a community member. These are all things that have been in mass discussions. We've had hours and hours of discussion on the topic of what the role of police should be in the city of Chicago and what reforms would we need in order to bring us into that utopian-like community that we all want to get to one day. We all want to feel that our officers are here to serve and protect. And while a great many of them are, we want to weed out those who are not. And how do we get there? How do you find that situation and get to that next step? And that is what we're asking tonight. Go ahead and give us a call. I'll say the number again, 312-738-1060. And let us know what do you think about the status and state of the Chicago police in the city of Chicago today. We're looking for your reform ideas. We're looking for your passions, your stories to help guide us on how we make our decisions as we come into the final days of putting together a draft consent decree to be presented to the Attorney General's office and the City of Chicago's leadership. We want to know what you think. We want to hear the stories. We want to have you call in and let us know. Send us an email, give us a call, or give us a call tonight and just let me hear you so that I can report it back and it can help guide my thinking as we make up our set of recommendations for how to move forward. One of the other topics that has been really big in our consent decree process is the idea of training. Having training that is more um, community-based, having officers when they're inducted into the and to the force to kind of come into the community and get their training there, feel like they're in a home place, a place of familiarity with the people, with the cultures, with what goes on, so that when they get into a situation that brings them a great deal of stress and might, in another instance, cause them to want to pull their weapon, they can actually kind of come back and back up onto their training to say, you know, this is a situation I'm going to handle a little bit differently. They learn some de-escalation from community members who are there and are able to have an open conversation about what's going to happen next due to whatever situation that they're in. These are the things that we're concerned about. Um, one of the other big topics that we've been looking at as of late is the idea of who is our um, police force. Are they representative of our city? As of current, they are not. But as we think about having a 33-33-33 situation, how do we get there? How do we get our officers to resemble our population, both in racial 
aspects and in cultural aspects and familiarity every neighborhood should be represented in our force just like in our city hall and our government everybody should be represented so that the voice is equal and the compassion is equal as we look to protect and serve that is something that we can't do without the voice and the the power of our community if we don't hear from you if we don't know what you're thinking then we're not able to fully come through and say we know that our constituency believes this and this is how we're going to advocate and fight on behalf of the people of the city of Chicago. Particularly, of course, because we are the West Side Branch, we do so ever so much more strongly on the West Side of Chicago, but we are Chicagoans as all, and we do represent the whole city. And we're looking forward to having a reformation that everyone can benefit from. We also understand that because the city of Chicago is the third largest city in the country, the differences that we make here in this reformation will guide the state and the country at large. So we're very concerned with making sure that we have all voices heard, all viewpoints seen, so that when we put this consent decree together, we're sure that it is representative of everyone because eventually it will serve the country. Um, Chicago is a big place, it's a very political place, it's a place that a lot of other places look to for their guidance, and we want to make sure that we do this right. Which is why we have joined this consortium of groups and um, agendas to make sure that we can have an idea that is well understood and put together by the community. If we don't have that, then we know that eventually five, ten years from now, we don't want to look at this consent decree and say, you know, we put together a set of rules and ideas that we're not going to be able to follow through for the whole country. There are people left out. There are people who don't feel protected, who don't feel served. There's still bodies in the, um, in the streets. If we don't have everything put together, we just don't know what's going to happen. So we have our ears open and our pens ready as we look to make this next step. It looks like we have a caller. Hello, caller. Thank you. Hello. Good evening. How are you doing? I'm fine. Thank you. Uh, you're doing a great cause up there. Thank Bless you. Bless your little heart. Uh, I have a comment in regards to the Chicago Police Department. Mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, speaking to Mr. Eddie Johnson, the captain, the chief. He's doing a pretty good job. But uh, I think they need to hire way more African-American officers. I don't think that they have quite enough. Every time they have the roll call, if they maybe put some African-Americans, which they're most of them pretty cool, maybe the neighborhood will be a little bit closer to them. They know the routes better. They know the communities better. They know there's officer friendly in those people. There's still some good officers out there. But on the other hand, there's always a couple of bad apples in every bunch. Unfortunately, there's nothing we can do about that. But the city of Chicago is a beautiful city. You guys are good on CAN TV. You have a lot of good people that come up and try to fight for the city, try to change the little streets, because it's really getting bad. Yeah. You know how our city is has been going back to gangsters all the way back to Al Capone days sweetheart and the best thing that we could do is be on TV advocate for peace and love and harmony back to the neighborhood with all races from all over the city this whole city is all made of immigrants but I believe if they hired some more African American officers it would make it a little bit sweeter. I mean, they like donuts, too, just like the next <laughs> officer. But you know what I'm saying? There's way too much violence, baby girl. It's getting so bad out there. You got a group called OG coming up. They're going to be having a, not, it's not called a march. It's a movement. And they're going to be coming through the neighborhood in May. I saw them on CAN TV the other day. They come in to put all through the gangbangers. Anybody want to step up to the plate? Kind of take it easy for a little while. Take, just take it easy. It can't be all about drugs anymore. It's way past that. Right. They got to take it easy and leave the gang banging alone for a little while. Take it easy. Bring back the love. We're hoping you that are, happens as are. the summer moves on, that people will start feeling um, the idea to, to take it easy. 
Um, there, as we did recently have some conversations with the Office of Inspector General, in which they said that there's such thing as a gang database. And no one knows how it's created, no one knows how it's monitored, no one knows how people are put in or out of it. And because of that, if you ever get put into that database, you are actually marked for the rest of your life. And if you're arrested, if anything comes up in that regard, you can spend some time in jail, a couple of days in jail every time you're found because of that gang database. Um, caller, I was really interested to know if you have a way to get more black people on our force. Um, if you have any methodologies on how that could be done, I would be interested to know because that is something that we are working on. Like I said, we do want to make the force representative of the population as it is kind of the population is more or less split into 33, 33, 33. And we're looking to make our pop, our force population representative of our city's population by doing those things and having some recruitment measures that allow for some of the things our caller was just speaking about. Allow for officers to feel like they're more home-based, that they're protecting their own families and neighbors, and that they're able to do so with much more compassion. I think when you talk in regards to the... Um, the gang banging uh, population of our city that they may too feel a little bit safer if they felt like they could trust the police. One of the things that we have as an issue is that we believe that there are people who are not calling the police simply because they don't know what will happen once they get called. They are in a situation that's bad. They're having um, conflict in their homes at times, maybe conflict out in the street with people who are not family members, and they have to deal with this struggle. Do I call the police or do I just try to deal with this on my own? Which danger is going to be bigger? And that's something that should never go through someone's mind when they're in a bad situation is who might get me first? Um, we all, that there's no safety in an idea like that. When you need help, that is why our police exist, is to protect us and serve us. When we come into negative and bad situations, and we shouldn't be worried about what they're going to do, almost in some cases worse than what we're worried about, what the offender or the situation that we're in, what it is going to bring about. So I appreciate your call. I thank you. It's good to know that there are other people who feel like our population should be more representative on the force. Um, some of the other ideas and thoughts that we've come across is the idea of the gang database that we do have computers and cars that are allowing officers to kind of profile people once they pull them over. You pull someone over for a traffic stop, you look into that computer and you find that they're in the gang database and you can pull up something that someone did 20 years ago. Um, we did hear from a gentleman who said that his grandbaby was in a car. He gets pulled over for a minor um, traffic offense, maybe a broken headlight or something of that nature. And when the officer pulls him over, he says, oh, so I see that you were part of the so-and-so gang um, back in 1988. And he goes, that is something so long ago. Why would you bring that up now? He goes, well, I just noticed that's what you do. And I've heard from other people in similar instances who said that they spent they're spending nights in jail while waiting for a bond, and in that time, they're losing their jobs. They're not able to keep up because, you know, a supervisor doesn't understand why you had to spend three nights in jail because you got stopped for a broken headlight. These are things that this gang database allow. The computers and cars allow people to kind of have a cause when there really is no cause to be arrested. And so these are things that we're considering as we look at our consent decree is how much background we want to have on individuals. As we've already spoke about months ago when we talked about the process of police records, we know that police records have had a ruling that they are destroyed every five years. And when an officer is looked at for promotion or termination, it has been deemed and judged that you cannot look into their record or their background and history to find out what they've done in their past for either way. Well, actually, you can look into their background if they've done something good and use it as a a merit for giving them a promotion, but you can't look into their background and see if they have any complaints or um, biases against them to make sure to give them a stance for a termination. And so the question is, is, if it's not important for us to be able to look into our officer's past to see what they've been doing, 
why are we so bound to look into the past of everyone else to see what they've been doing and how that's connected to why they've currently been pulled over or stopped for any reason. So these are the things that we want to really deeply consider and they're not simple. It's not a simple answer because we all have um, feelings and biases inherently in us about what we think should or should not be done to someone who has done anything wrong. And that's anything from having a broken taillight, which most would say is not wrong, to the murders and the, and the killings that are going on in our city. When you think about these things and you kind of try to make a judgment, you're asking each individual officer to be able to make that judgment on the stop on the spot. And while they have been trained, they are trained people, there's still a lot of pressure to have to be doing night after night for hundreds of people that you run in through, um, having to make these on the spot judgments. And sometimes they're not made well, and that is how we're ending up with blood in our streets and at the hands of some of our officers. And so these are things that we want to try to weed out to protect not only the population at large, but also to protect our officer population. There are some things that they should not have to be bound with as they're trying to conduct their jobs. So to that point, one of our main recommendations is that all officers on the force get a regular psychological evaluation on a annual or semi-annual basis in an effort to make sure that they're still fit to be on street duty. It is a stressful job as the city of Chicago currently is. They do have a lot of people who are treating them badly and are stressing them out in a lot of ways. And it might not be something that officers should do year in and year out, um, you know, 300 some days a year without any real true break from that stress. Um, maybe a rotation around the city so that they're not in high stressful areas constantly and consistently putting that stress on them. Some of our officers are suffering from trauma and that needs to be dealt with too. So we have put forth our, our recommendations to have psychological testing, like I said, on a semi-annual basis so that we can find out what's going on with our officers and make sure that they're still fit for the duty that they're serving. Um, these are a multitude of ideas that we've passed around. We've tried to formulate and write there are things in there about what happens to the survivors of victims who have been killed or hurt in the street. We found out that there are some people who don't get information. They're not able to access the body of their loved ones. They're not even able to see them actually on the street at the time. There have been accounts of people saying he was still alive, but because we were not allowed to get to them, medical um, Medical servants weren't able to get to them and they really just bled out in the street and that's really how they died after they were shot or accosted in any way. And these are all concerns to us of how we deal with the families and survivors of not just um, victims who were killed but also survivors of police brutality and violence in general. What happens? Do you just get a record and that's something that you have to deal with as we spoke about earlier? You become a part of a database that never allows you to be clean or free. You're marked for life. These are topics and issues that any one of us can deal with. I did have an officer tell me some time ago that you may not be as concerned with this issue because you think it can't happen to you, but that's not true. When you have a, a person who can pull you over for a a missed uh, signal. You're not putting on your signal, you get pulled over to be reprimanded and it ends in your death. These are very serious um, situations. The Sandra Blands of the world are very serious situation. Rikia Boyd was simply walking through an alley with friends of hers and she was shot in the head. These are things that we have to recognize that there are people who are dying in our streets who are not doing anything wrong and may or may not be the target of their of their death and Betty Jones was standing in the hallway of her own house and was shot and killed in her hallway because she was really what would we call our home in the right place at the wrong time simply because she all opened the door to officers she lost her life so we have to consider what's going on in our streets, what's going on with our governments and our force and the rules and regulations that guide all of us. Because if we don't, we don't know when it can be us and when our story will change and we may care a whole lot more. So let's put that change in now while we still can and while we can have some um, objective ideas about how to deal with this current police reformation in the situation that we're in. 
as we wrap up, I once again want to encourage you to come and join us at our um, monthly meetings that we have on the West Side Branch. We meet every first Saturday at 1 o'clock, um, except for in July. I encourage you to come and email us at the West Side NAACP at gmail.com or give us a call at 773-261-5890. Past that, I thank you for watching today and thank you to all of my callers. Good night.